So, Rob. Yeah, Jersey. Uh, I was talking with uh, Sharon Iverson at the Ann Arbor District Library about your upcoming appearance in January for mm-hmm. the Comic Artists Forum, where you're going to be doing a Skype talk for us. Yeah. And she was wondering, in, in February, so in January, we're going to have you do a talk about making comics. Uh, I, I guess I, if we've said where you live before, you're out of Minnesota. Oh, yeah. And uh, Minnesota, January, doing a talk over Skype. February, we're going to have Scott Yoshinaga and Audra Furichi of Nemu Nemu there in Hawaii. Uh, in February, we both know, being Midwesterners, what February weather is like, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what In our neck of the woods. Uh, it's, you know, people start eating each other because they can't get out of their houses because it's buried in snow. Yeah, your keys um, will freeze to your hands if, you, if, if you're not careful. <laughs> Things like that. <laughs> I remember, I remember one winter where, with the wind chill, it was reported. I didn't measure it, but it was it was reported that it was seventy below with the wind chill, Fahrenheit. Uh, I don't know, it was maybe like ten or twenty below regularly, but with the, like the strong winds that we get across the Midwest, uh, especially with the the Great Lakes in Michigan, all that lake effect weather. And I remember getting into my car. I was working late shift uh, at the casino, and I was scraping my car and everything, scraping all the snow off as we have to do. Got in the car, turned it, you know, turned it over, uh, and you know, and when it's that cold, it's like wow, 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 brrr, right? <laughs> and then as soon as the air came on, uh, all of the um, the moisture on my hands from scraping my windshield, like just instantly turned to steam from my body heat. So I was like, like moving, <laughs> looked like a guy who was tripping on something. So I was like moving my hands from my face going, whoa, because I was moving my hand, there's smoke coming off my hands. <laughs> but it was just because the, the, the temperature difference was so extreme because the air was so dry and so crisp and so cold. So anyway, that was, I don't even know what that was. That was a, not even a tangent. Um, no, I think so, it, so, it's like, it must be what it's like kind of uh, as far as like walking on the moon or something. Um, it's not quite, it's a little, little colder on the moon, but, uh, yeah, you know, you're, you're approaching that, that, uh, that level of desolation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, like, yeah, it's like you get an entirely different landscape when that weather hits. Mm-hmm. I mean, the landscape literally changes. Um, but anyway, so Sharon was asking, she said, wow, we got a, a Minnesotan for January, Hawaii, uh, residents in February. I wonder if we can get them when they do the Skype chat to be in front of a window <laughs> so we can see the environment behind them and we can see the cold frosty desolation behind you in january and then in february it's like oh tropical plants and volcanoes like shine in the background at uh, in hawaii yeah people just leaping and hugging and surfboarding yeah that's all that will be happening behind them and we're just all miserable and bundled up like uh, ralphie's little brother in a christmas story cool i'll do that you you guys okay. that's a that's a fantastic idea um the deal? Yep. Okay. I'll try to talk to Scott and Audra about it. They're at nemu-nemu.com, by the way. Give them web credit before we give ourselves web credit. Um, I'll tell you what. Here's here's my curveball today. Uh, I'm still reeling from yesterday's recording of Comics Are Great, episode 29, which is not available to download yet. Uh, it will be soon. Uh, if you're listening to this way after the fact, it's at comicsaregreat.com slash CAG29. You you were participating on that one in the chat. Yeah, I was there for most of it. And I think the big idea that um, I walked away with that I was really kind of stunned by was a repackaging of the idea that social media for content creators is different than people who just use social media. Like, like my brother who works for um, a motor company, uh, he, he doesn't... He's not a public figure, right? He's like a normal person, and uh, so when he, I watch him engage on Facebook, it's like, hey, what about the, what about the Lakers? You know, uh, he, he, here's a picture of my daughter. Uh, but there's something inherently public about being a content creator, a author, uh, or any kind of like, you know, a person who creates content to be consumed by the public, uh, some kind of entertainment or educational or whatever. Um, there's an implicit suggestion, at least this is what Eli's sort of in- assertion was, is that there's an implicit suggestion that we are public figures and the rules change for us when we do that. And so his, his, his suggestion, this is, now this is, I'm, I'm paraphrasing an opinion of one man. So this is, this is where these ideas get like what everything I'm saying right now is like potentially extremely muddy. Um, game of telephone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Danny's purple. 
the, 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 the idea mutates into something in, in unrecognizable. But what I wanted to throw at you was um, Eli's assertion that if you want to be, you know, share privately, make a private account for whatever you're using and then have your public account. And then he said, the number one rule is be interesting. Don't do the whole, I'm sitting in a bean bag, I'm eating chips, the chips are gone, I'm moving on to something else. Uh, you, you, there's something, something that has to be inherently entertaining or interesting in everything you share because it's another layer of content in your thing. Now, I tried to back out and say, well, what do we mean by interesting? Right, because interesting can mean being funny. Uh, you look at Weird Al Yankovic and watch his Twitter feed. He's posting; also, it's mostly funny pictures that he posts. Right, he's like uh, uh, he found a bank that was called Tomato Bank, and he took a picture of himself holding a big pile of tomatoes, looking sad in front of the bank. Said Tomato Bank, and then his his caption was, uh, "Oh darn it, they're always closed by the time I get there." You know, things like that. Um, but then, you know, does it have to be pure entertainment? Can it be an interesting thought? something that I've gotten yelled at before on Twitter, people said like, I'm unfollowing you for this, is uh, when I try to get a discussion started. I'm like, here's an idea that I read about in an article. I think it's really fascinating. What do you guys think? And then people start responding to my thoughts and I'll start retweeting their thoughts because I want to get a conversation going. And then people say, quit clogging up my feed. Um, so maybe that's the wrong way to do it. Or I'm guessing, my prediction is, is as I turn it over to Rob, the Zen master sitting over there with a the candle in front of him, uh, that there is no right or wrong way, but what I'm still struggling with is trying to define the word interesting in sharing content. Zing! <laughs> well, Take it uh, away. You, absolutely. What's funny is um, you, um, I don't know, we could, we could fashion a puppet of me, and uh, I think you could, you, you, I, you more or less, you nailed it as far as what I, what I would think, right? But uh, it's, it is very much subjective and it's individual. And I think it's super legitimate for someone who likes to sit, sit in, in, in a beanbag after they make comics or while they lament about the possibility of when they go about making comics, whatever their style is and they share their style, that's part of their content. People who choose to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And what's, uh, I think you could find examples of that where, where people are, are very good at just communicating those basic day-to-day -day things, and they happen to be an artist of a comic that you'd fo that you'd follow. And uh, depending on your interests, well, think think about things like uh, TMZ, something that I don't consume, but I know friends who do. Right? Mm -hmm. um, seriously. <laughs> oh no, no, it, me too, me too. I have friends who think TMZ is absolutely fascinating in a, in a strange, morbid way. Right? Yeah, or they watch like Keeping Up with the Kardashians, or you know, uh, if, uh, Hogan knows best. Uh, Gene Simmons' family jewels. Watching people walk around and try to do their laundry. Sure, the, right? the Osbournes being an, an older example too. Yeah, where uh, so there's the reality, the reality aspect, and sharing your experience. So you're you're going to do that when you're trying to do useful stuff. You're going to do that when you're telling stories. You want to draw. You want to draw people's attention to it. Or you could do that just by saying, "I ate a sandwich and I found a um, a chicken bone in it." I guess. <laughs> You know, if that's a possibility for you, but um, and your audience could think that any of those three different possibilities is either awesome or horrible, <laughs> and uh, that's all right. I mean, you, you, you obviously you, you. I guess it's about the act of um, cultivating your audience, and do you care about that? Um, being one, you could just ignore any of the feedback, and. Or you could you could choose to fine tune what you're providing based on that. Yeah. Well, that was the other thing that I think that's was not meant the to be a bad answer. I mean, that's not like a whole lot of like these these are all building blocks that could fit together in any way, shape, or form, or get chucked. Are you saying that you're speaking abstractly? Yes. <laughs> No, I, the other thing that, that Eli said that I was really grateful for is that after all that talk, he said, like, well, you know, don't change your message or your style to satisfy those six people who yell at you, right? And I think that's really good advice that we need to be reminded of all the time, is that there's going to be people who just are mad about something. And I'm not trying to diminish anybody's legitimate complaints about anything, but there's going to be people who are mad and you can't change what you do just to satisfy that because you got to... We, we probably talked about this before, I'm thinking, but... um. 
I think it, um, it. I think a little bit, but but not uh, not so directly because there's so many layers to it. Because you have uh, you have what you're putting out there, and are you tr- are you trying to um, fine tune it for the audience or not? And then um, if you are all in that mode of fine tuning, chances are you're going to be responding and adjusting based mm-hmm. on what the audience is is saying back. But even then, it's not precise because it's it's. Uh, if you're going to fine tune what you're sharing as a so you're you're an entertainer if you're providing comics or you're an educator if you're providing comics and um, uh, how to make comics and whatnot or illustration service and consult whatever you're doing a, as far as why you're reaching out and connecting to the through that social medium it's still a wide open as far as how you want to uh, uh, I guess it's worth um, to 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 reinforce things we've talked about before. I, I think it's 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 worth thinking about and doing on purpose. Reflect on it. Where do you want to go with it? Yeah. Um, th- that 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 word "interesting" is like such a slippery eel. You know, it's like be interesting. What? What does that mean? You know, uh, that 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 that's yeah. it's an interesting demand to put on ourselves. Uh, oh God, I use the word "interesting" to describe. The subject of being interesting, so but it, it's 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 a, it's a fascinating idea to think about being intentionally be, always being on. Maybe that's what I'm trying to say. Is like mm. maybe instead of saying be interesting, is that always be on when you're engaging with your audience? And and this I don't think is artificial. I do not think it's artificial because I've talked. I know I've talked about this before on one of the different podcasts I've done. Is the idea that. When I'm teaching a class, like a, a physical class, right? And I walk into a room full of kids and teach them about comics. No matter how rotten I feel, if I got in a fight with my wife, if I well, um, am running on four hours of sleep, or you know I'm worried about bills or whatever, and I'm dragging my feet to that door, the moment I cross that threshold, I'm somebody else. I'm like, hey, all right, we're going to talk about comics. Here's the assignment today. We're going to talk about these things. Here's some key concepts. And I... I turn on like a performer does because a stand-up comedian doesn't get to walk out on stage and go look guys i was up way too late last night and i should not have had that bottle of tequila so uh i'm gonna be a little quiet today you don't get to do that you know so it's but at the same time that performance and maybe stand-up comedy is a bad example because i got another curveball i could pitch at you if i wanted to is that i'm being sincere in my classrooms right when i'm putting on my game face or turning myself on for the for this for this uh, uh, class or workshop it's because i care about this and i and i'm being sincere about everything i say it's just that i'm not letting these people in on the background stuff because it's outside of the scope of that environment right um whereas with a performer <laughs> i was just watching a uh, stand-up comedian uh, daniel tosh have you ever watched that guy uh, i came across the name recently but no um very acidic humor <laughs> very harsh very it's like it's like uh i would say george carlin meets um don rickles but even meaner uh and and, and at times it could be very funny i mean i'm not making a judgment when i say he's mean i mean he he commands a very large audience so i mean something in there what he's doing is, re- is people are responding to and I, I mean it also goes to the idea about humor essentially being an aggressive act like you're pointing out something that you find is foolish or absurd and you're calling it out right yeah, but his stuff is is very it's it it is likely uh territory where someone's frustrated and they're trying to deal with that frustration through humor right right and so, but he, he'll go and say things like, um, you know, if, if I'm dating you and you gain 30 pounds, I'm going to break up with you because I'm that shallow, you know? And like, that's kind of like the, the humor that, 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 that's an example of the kind of humor he has. And I know I'm not representing him perfectly, but you know, you can find his, his, his stuff everywhere. Um, and make your own judgment on that. But what, what it spawned was a conversation between me and my wife where we were like, I wonder how much of that is really him and how much of that is the performance. Right. Uh, is this him? Is this Larry the Cable Guy? Where it's like he's not really that guy. He's just putting on a completely different persona. Or do these jokes come out of some kind of truth in this guy's character? Where maybe he is like a little bit of a jerk like that. But you know, then I think of George Carlin, who 
let's face it, George Carlin, his comedy is legendary. It was uh, it was very thoughtful and intellectual, but also incredibly filthy and rebellious, right? But then he did he was on Shining Time Station, right? So you know the the, the George Carlin persona you saw couldn't be the entire guy because he also did children's shows. I mean, if he was truly that character that walked on stage and said all those filthy things and somebody said, hey, you want to do Shining Time Station? He'd be like, no, F you. Get the F out of my face because I'm, you know, I'm not going to do that that floppy kid stuff, right? <clears throat> but to the same extent that, uh, uh, would you would you say that um, you're not the uh, enthusiastic, energetic um, uh creative instructor that you are because you have a hard day at the grocery store or um, you know a tough time working at um, mm -hmm. some home repairs that sort of tap into maybe more of your primal feelings <laughs> yeah I mean does that make I, not, does that make one or the other not genuine right no good point good point yeah, you know, I I, uh, I was going down, walking down the stairs to the studio, and one of my cats got in my way, and I almost fell down the stairs. And it's a concrete floor at the bottom, it's a dangerous thing. Out of frustration, I did. I said, like, you know, uh, I don't think I used a swear, but I think I just I yelled at the cat, like, why are you always doing this to me? You know, <laughs> it was just this, a screech of, of of primal frustration, like, why? It's like you just you're, you're trying to kill me. You're trying to kill me. I know you are. And Ann said that she had never. She was surprised. She was really caught, taken aback at how angry I was at that cat for just sitting there and just being a cat, you know. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. I mean, that's genuinely me. Yeah. The 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 the, the pink faced guy who's dancing around a room going, "I love comics," is also genuinely me. Yeah. So okay, there we go. Now we're talking about being interesting in your social media layer of your content and the difference between a public and private account too, right? Is like uh, be, being that performer. This this really reminds me of the um, the I don't know. I'm sure it's it's far more refined and and, uh, and uh, detailed than this. But it's my understanding that there's uh, there's two primary two primary schools of thought that look at the arts. There's those that uh, see them as purely an act of expression, and that is what's genuine. And the act of expressing being something that is not something that has the the thought or has an illusion of you know artists are just you know crazy wacky but very skilled people that just just randomly make neat stuff. But and then the, and I don't know. Wow, I bet I could really frustrate people with that as the definition of what how, how they uh, would view the arts. But then there's those that are like, well, we, we make arts. Uh, so the thing, we make arts for uh, for our use to express our ideas, to hold my coffee or my cereal, and and or um, uh, make my house look nice or whatever. So there you have the crafts and the and the uh, art as a uh, a business aspect. So uh, and then they're often at odds. And uh, to me, like this this conversation reminds me of that quite a bit, where there's the um, what is gen what is what's interesting and what's also what is uh, uh, it, or maybe what I'm inferring from the what's what's interesting question is is well what is real what's what's really that yeah yeah. yeah so in the act know. of trying to be interesting does that mean you have to be not fully genuine is that part of I think that's what I think that's what a lot of people have problems with is that I, I think a lot of people feel a res resistance to a persona as being somehow um, manufactured and, you know, synthetic. Uh, but but I think what's helped me in navigating these waters is having been working in classrooms for the past five years or six years now. Mm -hmm. um, it's taught me the difference between, you know, being a genuine performer and being uh, a genuine human being, <sighs> you know, uh, I, I think I think the, the the game face term applies to this. You know, put on your game face. This is still me, but it's me in this mode. It's operating in a mode. Maybe that'd be a way to put it to some people to make them understand the difference. Operating in a mode. So would would you like what would drive a person to choose a mode? Does it does it depend on what you're doing, or does it depend on who you're doing that for? Both, I think. I mean, and, and back and forth, right? 
I mean, it's it's like who who you're with. I mean, this is like go. Let's talk about Google Plus for a second. This is the thing that got me so excited about it, is that it was a technology that actually mimicked how in real life, when I'm around my dad, I talk one way, and when I'm at school, I talk another way, and when I'm with my wife driving her to work, we talk an entirely different way. You know, and and those are all really me, like you talked about earlier. Uh, so so. <laughs> It, it, it reminds me of gosh, conversations that have been going around and around lately about how the internet has kind of like interacting on the internet has conditioned some people to think that there needs to be a holistic, uh, consistent you that operates the same way in every circumstance. And if you ever contradict yourself or uh, act differently in a certain situation, then somehow you're you're in error. Right, wrong. That doesn't follow with the definition cardboard cutout of Jersey that I know. Um, and whereas in the things I think of, that, was it Ben Franklin who said, "Like I reserve the right to change my mind at any moment." You know. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is a cool quote, but it. Yeah, I'm not quite. I don't know who said that. It was Shakespeare. Um, reserve the right to, um, to uh, to learn or something like that. It, it, it's uh, I'm re that's how I remember it essentially. Um, to do something new because I, I, whatever, I discovered something or, uh, yeah. it's essentially saying that, uh, I can keep adapting. Yeah. So this is how so I, anyway, yeah. I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to beat this point to the ground. It's just, it's still hot on my mind and I was trying to get more discussion going on on Google plus about it. And, uh, and I knew that you would have some thoughts on the issue on the, on the act of being, uh, interesting while still being genuine. And knowing how to do that. And I think thinking about it as a performance, thinking about it as a switching into a mode, thinking about it the way that you that how you operate differently in different groups of people is probably a good rule of thumb to help it to help massage the idea into your brain so you don't feel like you're being phony. Nobody wants to be, I, I would I would guess that ninety nine percent of people don't want to feel like they're being phony. Right? Um I would guess as much, yeah. It's uh or, or or be perceived that they're being phony. Although that's going to happen. That's going to happen no matter what. Yeah, that's out of your control. Yeah. <clears throat> so, anyway, um, you're doing 24-hour comic day in a day or so? Yeah. In Saturday. Cool. Saturday morning, 9 a.m. I'll be at the uh, uh, Minneapolis Center for Book Arts. They're actually hosting event, an event. And, um, oh. Yeah. Are you going to be taking any pictures, doing any uh, audio? I'll experiment with uh, with trying to share the experience. Uh, it's definitely a, a show up. Um, I don't know what the, how to how to say it. Uh, get it's just kind of my way that you can do this any way you want, and and you see people that <clears throat> that uh, sharpen their pencils for quite a long time, or some people get straight to it, or some people will. Everyone's got their own way. Like for me, I show up and I get into it like heavy. I said, uh, I'm not preparing a story ahead of time. I'm not preparing anything other than I do plan on using characters. I plan, I, I know how I'm familiar with drawing. Uh, so, and I plan on using, uh, uh, I, I, I'm thinking about the tools that I'm going to use as well, but not actually the, the story. Right. Or the, yeah. That that's part of the the idea behind the twenty four hour comic too is that it's about discovering the story as you go, and which is supposed to also teach you something about like looking at building a comic in a whole new way through the desperation of trying to get to that deadline, right? I I, I understand that's part of the, the mission of the thing, or what some people point out as a value of the thing, right? Uh, it is for me. It's definitely um, an exercise in finishing, which. Um, I've, that's one of the, my favorite reasons to choose any art challenge. It's, uh, it's to practice uh, finishing, but then to throw some other spin at it, some twist. Um, mm. to, to practice finish, finishing, but also to learn whatever, something else. I just, I just would love to see you share a whole bunch from this thing. I mean, if you have time or the presence of mind, I think that'd be super fun to like check, like check in on you. Uh, every once in a while, because I know, like maybe maybe streaming the whole thing is out of the question, but uh, you know, hosting the occasional like Google Hangout or posting a quick little audio thing or like fifteen seconds of video of here's Rob cracking up. I don't know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> uh, 
No, that that sounds fun actually. Um, I'll add that to uh, to my list of <clears throat> challenges <laughs> to take on. It's actually something I I'm not not really good at that. I mean, typically when I do some sort of uh, published communication, even if it's a you know a tweet, it's uh, I think about it a fair amount. <clears throat> so those live events take. Um, I'm so con I'm so content to just be somewhere. Yeah. I'm just, you know, like, oh, this is this is neat. There's so many other artists here working on this or whatever. I I'm, I'm going to remember this experience. And then right. I, then I kind of uh really whiff the the whole idea of uh documenting it well, too. Uh, but I I I'll, I'll I'll give it a shot. Not everybody needs to be Ken Burns, you know. I mean, it's <laughs> it's just that I I just think that this is a layer of Going back to what we were just talking about, right? Uh, about how social media is a layer of content. And I think personally that as a cartoonist who gets involved in public events, it is um, sort of my responsibility to capture a lot of that experience for people who can't have it, right? I think about when I was growing up and I was, I grew up in a really rural part of Michigan. I mean, there were literally 25 kids in my class. It was like Little House in the Prairie. Oh, wow. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. There was, um, I remember there was a problem where a friend of mine couldn't go to homecoming with, I think, like almost every girl in the class because he was distantly related to them in some way. I mean, that, that sounds like a joke, like a Jeff Foxworthy joke, but it's totally not. That was the situation. We were in this very rural farming community. So I didn't have access to stuff like that. I didn't know what was going on in the world except through the TV. Um, so I think about like people who are in distant or remote areas. I get emails from people saying like, that's all well and good what you're doing in Ann Arbor, but man, you know, I'm wherever, you know, I'm in Montana. There's no community like that here. So it, it for me, I feel like a, a slight responsibility to capture these things, to let other people be a part of it in some way. Um, that's really awesome. That's I, very cool. I can see that being a, um, a good thing to have in mind to help, um, you know, spark the, give me some, you know, reason to do it more, right? That, that's a that's a really good idea to, to reach out to, to people who really um, don't have as easy of a time to to join that kind of event. Very interesting. Or, or yeah, or in some cases, it may be possibly inspire them to try to do it themselves in their area. Um, but also, here's another thing. I mean, beyond all this lofty, inspiring, and including... It's also, I just, I think it's interesting to see what other cartoonists are doing. You know, like whenever I see like somebody posting video or audio from an event, I'm like, oh, I want to listen in on this. I want to see what was happening there because I wish I could have been there. You know, it's just, it's just interesting too. But, you know, it, it, it's obviously, if it's something that doesn't occur to you at the time because you're too busy being there and then going back to your Zen master thing, right? Um, then just be there, you know, don't, don't limit your experience because, oh, I got to capture this. I got to capture this. I mean, it's something that comes naturally to me now. <laughs> Yesterday in class, uh, I had, a, and I'm going to do this on a, a fabulous secrets podcast. Uh, I had a kid show up 15 minutes late for class and I had already been through the whole rigmarole of, and I, this is an old teaching technique, but I was glad that I captured it. I went through, already went through the whole rigmarole of the assignment and explaining the, the, the parameters and reasoning behind the assignment. Uh, and so this kid gets there and he's like, so what I miss and I was like, well, uh, you know, Jenny, why don't you tell him what he missed while I get the paper and pencils ready? And it was a chance for the kid to, to, to demonstrate her understanding of what the assignment was while she was also making a connection with this new student because she, this is the first time these two kids ever met. So now, you know, that's an old teaching trick. But it was the moment she started doing it and she was doing such a good job. Like this is like a, t a 10 or 11 year old girl reiterating the concepts that I was teaching and she did it through analogy and, and she was making analogies for the, the concepts. I grabbed my phone, pull out my pocket, hit record. <laughs> and I saw her look at me like, what are you doing? And I'm like, don't worry, I'm not taking your picture or nothing. I just want to grab this audio because I might use it in something later on. It was too cool of a moment to not capture. So that, anyway, it's, it's something that comes out from the hip for me. It's just like, grab it now, you know? Yeah. I look at that as like, like any habit. Um, yeah, I w if I if it's uh, if it's not an enticing habit to to build or grow, I would uh, I would politely decline <clears throat> and uh, not worry about it. But no, I, I I like that idea. I I have found it helpful, and and I'm not in a rural area. When uh, yeah, I notice when when you share things from from various events and other other folks I follow on on Twitter, it's it's fun. 
to yeah to get get a you know an an eye in person where it's 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 not like being there but you get yeah. to share the experience a bit right that's cool um so okay well going back to something you said a minute ago where you were saying about how you don't have a story prepared you and that's part of the idea behind 24 hour comic day mm -hmm. um I had a topic to pitch at you, uh, and and I and I hope this doesn't tell me stop me if that you think this would damage your experience doing twenty four hour comic day because one of the questions that I often get in my classrooms and one of the things that I find is most difficult to teach is answering the question how do you make a story right all this stuff about panel size uh, size relationships line changes, how color affects our perception. Uh, all these things can be taught in some way. Like if you understand that a big panel means larger moment, more emphatic moment, smaller panel means less emphatic, shorter amount of time. You know, big, yeah. big word balloon means it's loud, et cetera. We can grasp these concepts, but how do you knit all that together into a story? And uh, all I can ever do is come up with analogies to try to, like going back to, um, you know, the old concept. And this was a Bruce Lee quote in one of his movies. Uh, I forget which movie it was, is that the finger pointing at the moon, you know, I can point at the moon, but if you concentrate on the finger, you miss all the heavenly glories. That was the actual quote from the Bruce Lee film. But I know that it comes from an older text. Uh, I forget which one, but or older philosophy. Um, so uh, what I got is I have an analogy that I wanted to start bouncing back and forth about how to construct a story. And I thought it'd be appropriate to release this right before 24 hour comic day as a, for the guy or gal who's at the art desk panicking going, where do I go with this thing? Come up with an outline of a mode of thinking or a, a, a way of thinking about how to construct a story. Do you think that would damage your experience if you, if you think about this beforehand? Because if it will, I, I don't want to do it. I want to change tracks and do something else entirely. No, actually, what I what I forgot to tell you is that my secret joy is watching other artists suffer. So I, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm happy to share whatever I could. You know, if it would be of help to others uh, as far as um, uh, making a story. Um, so what? Where where would you like to go with that then? Um, okay. Well, I have an analogy here that I want to start kicking around. Um, one of the things I always tell people, and especially my adult students, because they have more life experience, uh, is that first of all, a lot of writing characters is just playing pretend. If you can remember what it was like when you were on the playground as a kid, and there's another kid running at you, and they're like, hey, I'm Digar, I have shovels for hands, uh, oh, I'm, I have a deflector shield, and you announce all your moves because you're, you're imagining a world, you're imagining interactions, and it's all happening live, you're responding to their their stimulus and their input and you return with more imagination right um that that's part one i mean that's like okay you know kids in a playground try to remember what that felt like playing pretend that's that's playing characters except you're playing all of the kids in the playground right um but the second one that i try to use a lot and and i have a lot of trouble getting headway with this one with with certain students is all writing a story is is when you go up to somebody and you say, you're never going to believe what happened to me the other day. That's a story. It's just relaying a series of events with a point. And whenever you say, you're never going to believe what happened to me the other day, you're already starting with the hook. You're starting with the lead or the tease. And um, you know what the point of your story is. Otherwise, you wouldn't be so excited to tell them that. Right? And if you could take one of those personal anecdotes that you share at the office or on the water cooler or around at a family get together, and you, if you can break that down, then you've got the, the essential outline of how to construct a story. Um, and I'm betting you're reading a book on stand-up comedy right now. And uh, I bet this relates to the construction of a joke, like the setup and then the response and then the punchline and that kind of thing. Uh, I think it does, um, and I'm, I'm I'm definitely trying to refine my approach by looking at uh, joke structure and thinking about what, thinking about how jokes are essentially uh, they're a neat thing to analyze to think about surprise and reveal in stories in general. So I look at that as sort of a refinement mm -hmm. where you you have your your water cooler story, but then you want to bring in these extra the spice and the moments that that uh, that well hook people to begin with, but then continue to pull them along. 
And it's it's um, one way to do that is through these delightful uh, surprises and, and curveballs that you can throw uh, your readers where they will have an expectation that you've set up by um, sort of uh, by starting your story. But then you play off an assumption that you've planted by giving them that expectation yes. and yes. then bring in a surprise from a different angle. Yep. And that's that, just that's... embody that magic. And, and uh, I find them helpful to study for that. Absolutely. You just you just explained like the the process of telling a good anecdote. The difference between and this is this is how I further you know sculpt this analogy in my classrooms is telling an analogy is not or telling an analogy telling an anecdote is not going up to somebody or it can be but it's usually not very good you're going up to somebody saying um, these guys they they were on the corner and there was a dog and then they walked over to the mailbox and they looked in the mailbox and the bus came and then the bus didn't pick them up because they missed the bus and then they had to walk and then they got to work right you know think of like kids in the hall uh, uh bruce mccullough's character gavin these guys smoke you know uh that is not an interesting anecdote that's a relaying of a sequence of events without any context without any meaning without any reason that the uh, the recipient should care why this is going on. So you got to get them hooked. You got to get them involved. And so you set up expectations. So there I was. And I thought this was happening. And then this worst thing happened. And oh my gosh, I, I really, like, <laughs> I just told a, a story at, uh, in Mixed Company recently where I was uh, holding my hand like this the whole time as I was talking about it, And I was like showing them my morale. Like, oh, I thought this was happening. And then this happened. And then all of a sudden this happened. And I felt really good. And then all of a sudden it went even worse. But even though it ends on a bad note, I walked away with this mm -hmm. and I came out here, you know, <laughs> I charted it. I charted it for them as I was telling them the story. <laughs> Isn't that awful? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's, a... that's totally the, you, you added a, a meta element to your, <laughs> to the real world there. You know, it's like the, uh, the, the points in Scott Pilgrim when, when people get punched or whatever. And, uh, oh yeah. Okay. Well, nice. but uh, anyway, I wound up when I told the story, my audience seemed receptive. You know, I mean, maybe they're being polite. I don't know, but they seemed to genuinely laugh at something. And, and at one point when I described the part where the morale went way down, one of the guys actually exclaimed like, oh, Jesus, you know, like that. <laughs> so empathized and yeah, I, I, I had his empathy. I had him involved in what was happening in my anecdote. So then when I got to the point when it went way up high, he was like, oh, cool, something really great is going to happen. And then it got worse. And this really happened, this thing that I'm referring to, okay. as anything in life happens, right? Like lots of things in life happen where you think it's going to be one way and it turns out another. And learning how to pace those things and to describe those things in such a way as to elicit empathy or to get people to set an expectation like, oh, I know where this is going. Oh, right. That's really tricky stuff. And that's stuff where it's kind of like it's like when you're making food without a recipe, you're just tasting it. Is there enough salt in there? No, I need more salt. Would it surprise you, know, you gotta... cook that way all the time? Pretty much. What's that? Would it surprise you that I, that's how I typically cook? <laughs> <laughs> like you, you actually like pinch with your fingers. You don't actually break out the measuring spoons. Almost, yeah. I, uh, it's all by feel. <clears throat> yeah. But the, uh, uh, it's interesting. The, those refinements. This is this is the. I don't know what you call it. Uh, it's my perspective, uh, and and we all have our quirks when we create things or whatever. I don't want to, you know, assume everyone does this, but. Uh, it's super exciting as you're working on practicing some aspect of your craft and then you discover that next skill and then that becomes the definition of finishing something possibly or or it adjusts what you thought you were building toward and this is where 24 hour comic day would come in and say I'm 24 hour comic day I don't care about all these uh, I don't care about your joke structure I don't care about your pacing um, I don't really care about how detailed your crowd scenes are <laughs> Uh, I care about it being 24 pages in 24 hours. See you at the end. And uh, <clears throat> th there you go. Uh, it's so I, no, you yeah. go ahead. No, finish your thought. I'm sorry. No, I think it's um, it's a way to 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 flavor and spice your meal of 24 hour comic day to add a pinch of uh, uh, more interesting anecdote 
by using uh, personal perspective instead of being uh, uh, objectively describing people you don't know. I mean, throw yourself in the scene, all that kind of stuff, and then adding twists and surprises and expectation and setup. And but um, don't get lost, with, you know, uh, in 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 those details without having an eye on the the clock. Sure, sure. To make another analogy on top of all these analogies uh, is we're describing swimming technique when you're in a, a pool in a controlled environment. 24-hour comic day is it's a windy day, surf's up, we're going to drop you in about, you know, half a mile from the shore. See you at the shore. <laughs> you know, you're, and you're fighting those waves going, hey, but I got to remember my technique. I got to remember the proper stroke method. No, not at this point. Now it's just try not to drown. You know, that, that that's really what we're describing here. But should you suddenly get caught in a riptide and, uh-oh, you know, uh, I got to get out of here, that's the time to remember some survival skills, and that's all I'm trying to do here. Yes, exactly. It's, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons to, to jump into this, is to experience that, uh, that adaptation. Uh, you'll find yeah. out what, what's, what's coming natural to you that day and, uh, and, and jump in. And, there's good, and what's funny is depending on how you choose to go about it, if, if, you are in, if you're alone and just streaming on the internet or calling a friend once in a while, like I guess back when, when uh, 24 Hour Comic Day was started, it would be Scott McCloud and, and I cannot remember his, uh, his buddy that they would just talk on the phone. And, it was Rick Veitch. Okay. Rick Veitch. Is that his name? That's How it. you pronounce it? V-E-I-T-C-H. Learning German has forever ruined my EI combinations. I can never remember how, how it is in English versus how it is in German. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, I think that's who it was. Or Steve Bissett, one of the two. Ah, uh, yeah, could have been. Um, and anyway. They would just sorry. talk on the phone sometimes or whatever. But no matter what your environment is and, and your social arrangement or non-social, you're, you're going to face things. <laughs> um. And, uh, that's, uh, that's part of the, that's part of the challenge. So you'll, you'll, uh, yeah, bring in whatever, whatever you can. Sorry, I got distracted a little knock at the door or whatever there. Uh, oh, oh, no. I thought, I th see that, that came across as like a thoughtful moment. Ah, uh, you were just, nope. I'm just are. wondering if I should uh, ignore the door <laughs> and the answer is, yeah. you want to go get the door? No, nope. you can go get the door if you need to. I mean, if you're expecting something. Uh, like what, what if what if there's a gas leak? Uh, Please edit this. No problem. There's no gas leak. Uh, all right. Now I'm going to be stressed out for on your behalf. Um, you've got you got a 24 hour comic in the uh, video here. We oh, could yeah. talk about. This is uh, this is from last year's uh, 24 hour comic day. Um, what uh, what would you like to delve into about it? Well, I mean, did you start this thing with a... Okay, you don't start with a story in mind. You said you start with characters that you know how to write. Um, but I'm curious, you know, I, I didn't do a 24... I've never done a 24-hour comic. But I did do that eight-page finished mini-comic in a week, that Boulder and Fleet. Now, mm -hmm. eh, eight pages in a week, not a big deal. But it was on top of all my other work, my teaching work, my freelancing work, etc. So it was, an, it was an accomplishment. Just trust me on this, everybody. Um... But one of the challenges I set to myself is I said, I don't know what the story is going to be. I cannot use characters I've ever done before. I cannot do a story that I've had prepared because I got lots of stories and notes that I could just pull out if I need to. But so when facing the blank page, one of the ways that I got into doing that story was I said, well, what's what's a, a topic or theme or point that I feel really passionate about, but I don't feel comfortable expressing it publicly? I don't want to, like, it, the, the, the story in the first issue of Boulder and Fleet was based on a conversation that I overheard between some artists, and it really ticked me off. It really, I, I couldn't disagree with those people more about what they were saying. And, uh, but I, instead of going online and saying, those people are idiots, you know, don't listen to them. I disagree with them. Uh, I decided to take that passion and let's put it poetically into a story. Let's express my opinion on this matter through characters so that I make an entertaining story. And uh, I get to get this out of my system without actually attacking anybody. Do you do you do that? Do you start with that? Do you ever start with like, okay, here's a bucket of of uh, bees in my bonnets that I could possibly throw into this thing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, being guided by something that is, uh, oh, 
something on your mind that you want to communicate, something that's frustrating you. I mean, it's a good it's a good place to start. Something that is inspiring you, or or what have what have you. Um, so for you, it was uh, just this this uh, the structure of the story is what really brought you to it. No, it wasn't even the structure. It was that okay. Here's the argument that I'm going to I'm going to investigate through this story. I didn't have a structure. I had essentially an idea about like I came up with like okay, these characters are going to go here and they're going to encounter this, um, and my my argument is going to be expressed through the heroes. The villains are going to express the opposing argument. The the, the thing I heard those people say that I totally disagreed with. Right. Um, and that was just it was more or less of an inroad to come up with let's get the ball rolling let's 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 instigate something here uh and hopefully use that as a framing mechanism to find my story beats because then if i'm if i start heading in a direction where well maybe they do this next does that refer to what my argument is no doesn't need to happen it's a way to like do some on the fly editing while i'm building something really fast does that make sense yeah, it does, and it and, and it, you reminded me of how uh, telling a, a shorter story can be actually really hard as an exercise. Also, um, yeah. getting that kind of complete thought in eight pages is yeah. Uh, that that I don't know if I did it anyway. I'm not going to profess that I did a like a, a wonderful job of it, but I I felt satisfied with the book. Um, so okay, so we're looking at yours. I mean, so I, I was just trying to get at like, did you start with to pull up uh, Boulder and Fleet too while we were talking? Since we're on on video uh, podcast, I mean, right now we have this example, but um, let's talk about this example then. We can talk about Boulder and Fleet later. Uh, no, okay, cool. Um, so let's see how I, to to share how I started and how in general I, I start when I when I go to write. Um, I start by the the writing and thumbnailing, and I go back and forth and. What guides me is thinking about a change, just from point A to point B. Like the the story starts out with a certain idea, and then it will end with the twist on that idea. Uh, and then what I try to do in the middle is add more uh, more waypoints between point A and point B. So how do they get from? And and so with this, I, I sat down and thought, uh one of the things that helps focus me is is uh, well, I'll think about something I want to improve at, and I, I'll um, I thought, well, I want to tell a story with uh, Pick and Crunchy, two characters I love, but I want to focus on something totally different than I would normally tell in the in the uh, the main story of uh, of Art Geek Zoo, The Way of Sound. I thought I'm going to talk about a a crush or a relationship Pick had in high school. And uh, I'll make it about the uh, Pick's decision, well, which is the title of the story, Metal or the Girl, essentially. Uh, yeah. And then so why would that need to be a decision? So a lot of people would say, why, why not Metal and the Girl? And how does that work? So that, that led to uh, how do you get from point A to point B was a lot of questions that I just filled out in an outline. And Awesome. You did this before you started drawing? Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. And uh, that's uh, that helped that helped me quite a bit. But then I didn't know if I was generating too much too many ideas that would fit. So then I started thumbnailing and seeing if um, this story with th you know these these events in it uh, will it fit? And uh, what do I have time for too? Because part of it too is I I, I edited as I went along, uh, realizing um, that I was taking too long on some pages and I was redrawing and so I had this uh, so other quirks and habits you'll are you'll, you'll stare at um, in, in the mirror as you're trying to do this in 24 hours yeah for me it was the whole zoom in too much and start noodling with the artwork and using undo way too much oh you did this all digitally this was all digital on um, on my um, mod book which it will be again Cool. So this was illustrated in Photoshop then? On uh, Ske in Sketchbook Pro. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. The uh the word balloons are actually done in Illustrator because that that isn't something I wanted to try to do differently and I have a process that I like a lot that works really quick for me. Um, okay. So I just would uh I dropped the PNG into a an Illustrator layout that was of the right 
size and then go through my normal word balloons. Export again as a PNG. And uh, I say um, I love PNG as a format, just by the way. Yeah, uh, why, why do you like that better than GIF? Uh, for no other reason other because of the uh, PNG was born out of that whole contro controversy surrounding the GIF format in the uh, in the 90s. Uh, who was it? Uh, oh gosh, uh, Unisys or something. They owned a patent to the GIF format, mm -hmm. and then they decided to start uh, enforcing it, and everyone was using it quite a bit because it was it's an efficient um, indexed raster format. So it mean, indexed means you're not using all the colors. You're using a very small set of colors and raster meaning it's uh, pixels. Uh, so you could do large artwork depending on the way the artwork, the information in the artwork, you could get some pretty small files. And so it was very popular and, and whatever. A lot of people were frustrated, including me. And PNG was born out of it. And what's cool is it's kind of a super format because it does that job and it does JPEG's job. It doesn't do JPEG's job as good as JPEG, though. But it allows okay. for alpha transparencies and stuff. Anyway. Um, yeah. The uh, I highly recommend reading the entire Wikipedia page on PNG. Awesome. <laughs> and you'll experience... There's, there's, there's Rob's uh, format nerd moment of the week. <laughs> What's it like to love a format? <laughs> so... Um, <clears throat> Going back to this, I like this idea of if 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 you're stuck, you know, because like some people might argue with you that hey, this project is about improvising. It's about improvising a story by giving yourself only an hour to do each page. Mm. Um, I don't want to get into a purist versus not purist debate because anything can be anything to anybody, right? the The, the whole thing is it's inclusive. Everybody can participate in their own way. You know, even your pages are a different format than what was originally conceived of for 24-hour oh, yeah. comic day. Yeah. So uh, I like this idea of either starting out with an outline of here's like, let's prioritize our points. Here's the big idea. Here's some smaller ideas. And let's connect these smaller ideas to support the big idea with questions. Why? How? You know? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just what. This is maybe this is a way of thinking about it is what is the series of, of events. But the what comes out of figuring out what the why and the how are. And when I say how, I mean, I think about this is, this is language that I picked up through teaching work is you don't ask yes or no questions to your students, right? Because that's just good. Yes, sure, why not? Uh, you say, how, did, how does this change the way we feel about it? Now I'm asking for elaboration. Now I'm asking for their thinking process. Why did you make this such and such and not that? Now I'm going to ask them to um, justify their decisions on the page, right? Mm -hmm. Requires more sophisticated thinking to ask how and why rather than what or which. Which panel is bigger? That one, you know? I haven't really asked them to do any kind of like real sophisticated uh, judgment there except to evaluate what they see in front of them, right? Right. Um, so... This connective tissue of the what is the how and the why. Now, that is abstract. I think I get the abstract award this time. <laughs> that probably made sense to two people. <laughs> it's, no, I think, let's see. I think it makes a lot of sense, especially as you think about um, composing composing a story because those are those are your building blocks. And it's just that the what fills in what the building block is made of is well, it's your characters and the setting and their actions and the, the, that exemplify the uh, how things are occurring and why. Mm -hmm. Whereas I noticed that you stopped, you stopped toning the pages later on, too, as we're getting to the end of the story. There's no right. gray tones. Yeah, I, found, I, I, was in a, I was in a pickle with, uh, with time. And, uh, and I, yeah, I, I wanted to stay true to having... Um, <laughs> I cheated with the last page and just had them uh, come back together. Sorry for spoiling it, uh, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, yeah. There was a lot of trade-offs, and sure, someone could say that uh, this doesn't exemplify whatever objective version of the challenge. Uh, fair enough, um, but for me, I did the twenty-four pages that uh, that I wanted to do that that finished the story. So. Mm -hmm. 
um, I got to that. I got from point A to point B. Yeah, that's that's the big idea. You, yep. you composed the story and you you did the drawings mm -hmm. uh, to tell the story. So, huh? So I mean, what was what was the uh, anything that you? What was the big takeaway from doing it the first time? There must have been something to make you want to do it again, unless you're just bullheaded and just, you know, you like to take on challenges just to see how far you, you can go before you crack. <laughs> um, let's see. Some of it is, uh, I don't know, just uh, practicing being uncomfortable because it it's a... Uh, uh, it's an exercise that I find uh, that I find helpful to uh, to be able to create the things I think of creating and know that mm. uh, I'm going to finish this and uh, I can draw upon those experiences when I'm uncomfortable they're, they're often fresh ideas and examples that uh, because I, I was forced to adapt and to come up with these then I come I bring these adaptations back to um, back to other projects so it's sort of uh, speculative and research and experimental and seeing what comes yeah. um, And it happens to be one of those kinds of experiments that's not just, uh, there's definitely a lot of, a lot of discomfort involved. <laughs> so. You know, and I think that that's probably like the, the bigger, the biggest idea of all about a, a project like 24 hour comic day is it's not about the rules of engagement. It's about, like you said, it's about getting from point A to point B in a very strict time frame, and then discovering survival techniques to get you through that. Mm -hmm. And then, which it serves a lot of purposes, right? It, it, it boosts your morale later on when you're working on other projects and you're like, Oh God, you know, that, that, that creeping feeling comes in of like, I'm a hack. I'm no good. I don't know what I'm doing. Dude, you did that. But then also it's going to like one of the things that Scott McCloud said about 24 hour comic day is that, uh, as, as the inventor of the thing, um, as he said, you'll never think about your storytelling the same way again. And I always wondered what that meant. I always wondered like I'm gonna like suddenly it's like it's like when you start talking about abstract concepts like Nirvana enlightenment and things mm. like that where having, it's like you think what's that and having kids and having kids yeah you'll see colors in a totally new way and as a guy who doesn't have children who has not achieved the blissful state of Nirvana and uh, <laughs> you know all these things sound really strange to me like really really it's gonna change that much and <laughs> part of me gets like into that Star Trek Five, Captain Kirk, like I need my pain. Don't push me in that direction. You know, I my pain defines who I am, and <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to change like that. Um, but but then again, I I do begin to understand this idea of you'll never look at it the same way again because now you have developed new, you know, new appendages to help you survive in that that dangerous environment that you can call upon for when you're in less dangerous environments, when you're just, you know, doing the day-to-day -day slog, right? Exactly. Like, I, I actually have my Boulder and Fleet one um, pulled up that I can up, I can try to upload while we talk. Oh, um, excellent. So how do I, oh, I just got to make a new pod, is that it? Uh, yes, there you go. And new share, here we go. Share document, let's see if it, this is too big. It's so something we're gonna browse. Our, our comic day is just a... Uh, I mean, it's a it's some structure, some thing to go about uh, that process. That there's no reason why you can't do that on on, on any project, any day. But um, for some reason, if uh, it, it depends on you know you and your learning style, and you know it's like, well, why why do people do hard stuff sometimes? You know, why would someone train for a marathon? Why would someone train to uh, I don't know. Get get a black belt, or why would you? Uh, let's see, why would you? Uh, why would you climb a mountain? Yeah, you know, why'd you climb a mountain? Or, or some client, pro, some client work. I mean, some some sometimes you could, you know, it's like, okay, here, uh, finish this website, finish this uh, drawing, the story, or whatever, in like the, uh, a weekend, right? Friday to Monday mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. Why would you take that on? It's uh, sometimes I suppose it would be for the um, uh, for trade because you need to. Um, other times it's it's just to get better at what you do. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's well, I, we're talking about a bit of a philosophical mindset now, this idea of always being afraid. You know, this is something I take very seriously. Is like, if I'm not terrified of what I'm doing, uh, I don't feel like I'm doing something really all that valuable to me, mm. right? And that, that sounds like dumb and X games and all, like super challenging. Like, you got to push yourself and get in there. Like, I'm sounding like some kind of coach or something, you know, and I don't want to be that guy. But um, but no, I, I think about how, you know, it's, it's, it's a great uh, litmus test for knowing if I'm doing something I'm going to enjoy doing or I'm going to feel satisfied with later on is, is putting myself in a, in a situation where I don't know if I'm going to make it through this thing. If I walked into every project feeling like, I got this, then hmm, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of value to be uh, achieved through doing it other than just doing the thing itself. I like there to be more layers to the value, personally, if that makes any sense. Totally does. That's why I will add uh, extra a couple of extra curveballs to 24 hour comic day because no matter what I'll get those experiences out of it. Yeah. So um, I'll tell you one of the big takeaways from doing this Boulder and Fleet thing, which again is not a 24 hour comic, but was a comic done under severe time limitations. Um, I remember, and I documented this in the Thunder Punch daily show back when I was doing this story um, is I remember I started out with one theme that I was going to one 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 method of attack at my argument, and I realized quickly that there's no way I can do that in eight pages. I got like halfway through the story, I was like, "There's no room to to really express this idea clearly uh, with the space allotted." And um, I had it, I had it sketched out that at the end of the story. So like, okay, okay, I'm looking at the pages right now. So what happens is Boulder and Fleet, these two adventurers, come into this town. It's run by this guy who everybody just calls his eminence. He's like this lizard guy with uh, spiky armor. And there's like one rule in the town is that unless you conform, conform to their standard of quality and excellence, you can't live here. You cannot be part of our community unless you... And, and really what this comes out of, it was uh, the, the theme was I overheard some cartoonists talking about if you aren't classically trained as an illustrator, you can't call yourself a cartoonist. Literally, you can't, you know, like if you're self-taught or if you have a crude style uh, that precludes you from being a cartoonist forever. You know, and, and, and their argument was in favor of, well, we want the word cartoonist to have some sort of value. I'm like, dude, oh, you, you are so missing the point. But anyway. Uh, so that was the inspiration for this bad guy. And so Boulder and Fleet uh, say that, uh, you know, we can't work for you because, you know, we don't like the way you operate. Oh, it was because, um, yeah, here we go. If we go to this page. So more now with that explanation, Jersey. What's that? <laughs> I hate your bad guy so much more now <laughs> with that explanation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Please continue. I, I Well, like I said, I tried to be very uh, oblique about what I was referring to in this. Um, somebody actually called me out and said, uh, oh, is this about your teaching work? About you not being like a classically trained teacher and this is you defending your position? As, and I was like, oh gosh, no. This isn't about me defending myself. This is me defending people who work in stick figure, who are great storytellers, who other people mock for not being good illustrators. You know, that really, that that's, that's a way to push my buttons fast. But anyway, so yeah, um, when the bad guy meets Boulder and Fleet, he's like, oh, Boulder, you look like a big, strong bear. You look like somebody who meets our standards of excellence. You should, you should join our organization. But then Fleet, the little bird, is like, okay, well, you know, we charge by the hour and whatever. Uh, and he laughs at her and says, no, nah, no, nah, we met your big friend, not you silly little thing, right? So now I'm using size as my metaphor. Big equals good. Small equals, like, well, he doesn't see the value in what she is, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so when Boulder says, well, no, I'm not, we don't work with any, you, we're a team. You don't get me without getting her. Um, there's more, and he says, you know, there's more, more to this job than size, right? There's more to this job than what is apparently quality. And uh, the bad guy says, don't tell me what a real pro is and is not, you know, because they're the ones who are going to get really defensive about it. So they, they, they start fighting. And it was at this point that I realized I don't have the room to really express this guy's core philosophy. I was going to express the theme through an argument during the fight because that's another thing that I get really passionate about is I like that comics can actually have dialogue during an action sequence. I know that's unrealistic, but so is rendering people in lines. So um, I, was, I didn't have the room. And I had it in my notes that eventually Fleet was going to be the one to deal the killing blow. Fleet was going to hit him in the face 
And then that inspires all of the people in town to go and beat him up. And all the little animals, all the little stuffed animal looking creatures are the ones who take down the big bully, right? Uh, which is a cute idea. It makes us happy. Ewoks, right? It's an old idea. Um, but, uh, oh, actually what it was, was I don't think I had it in my notes that Fleet was the one who did that. I think it was just that they get inspired by the fight to get involved. And then when I, when I realized I didn't have a way to express my theme, I realized that the theme was there all along. It was there with the animals attacking at the end. And let's just have Fleet lead the charge. Fleet leads the charge and inspires all the little guys that, yeah, we may be smaller. We may not conform to this guy's standard of quality, but we're valuable too. And they run the guy out of town at the end. There, I spoiled the story. It's an eight-page story. How can you spoil an eight-page story? But anyway, so the point, the, here's my takeaway. My takeaway was is that I learned to trust myself as an author a little bit more. And that things I put down on the page intuitively may come out to become more important, may, may rise to the surface to be more important later on as I'm going through the spade work and grunt work of connecting all the pieces. So if I were to do a 24-hour comic, I'd start with my argument and start in, in, instinctively and, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of, like not, not subconsciously, that's what I'm trying to say, subconsciously start throwing stuff on the page, trusting that there's good stuff in there someplace, and I'll figure it out as I go. That's that's probably a, a a pretty darn strong approach. Um, what's 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 interesting is the. I mean, obviously, it's it's all that's very individual, and and uh, I don't mean to say I'm judging your approach, but like the, I, <clears throat> I was already thinking about some of the strength in doing this, and over a longer period of time. That's one of the reasons you'll let's see. It's not just what you get directly out of twenty four hour comic day. It's what you've squeezed out to not include, to then appreciate. And I think that the, the part of what helps me write better stories and why, I mean, I, I, I think I had fun with writing Metal or the Girl, but um, what, what I ended up learning is weaving together those, those in-between moments, it helps me to reflect on it a little bit and, and, or to just actually not even like think about it deliberately, but just to now appreciate the thing I just made and and like play it back and sort of flip through the pages and all of a sudden realize intuitively the next thing that should occur instead of just operating on a prescribed map yeah and yeah. whereas during 24 hour comic day because of the approach i chose i had a fairly prescribed map that i just needed to then finish um, I can see how it would be really helpful to then realize the theme and the uh, uh, the subtle things that were in your creation the whole time, just because because of you you were creating it. Right, right, yeah, and and I'll tell you, you you've probably been here too. That's the moment where you're like this, where you're doing the double fisted, shaking your hands over your shoulders, like, oh my gosh, I did it. I am so good. I feel like a million dollars. I'm going to walk down the street with my chest out, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. those, are, those are really, really satisfying moments, which is weird, right? Because it's like it's the part that happened intuitively. You're getting excited about your intuition uh, over getting excited about what you did deliberately. Like when I do something deliberately, somehow it doesn't feel as satisfying as when I do it kind of like from the hip and naturally. Uh, I guess I guess it like comes out of that notion of talent. We like to think about... Mm. A lot of people like to think about things as being talent, and I always get a little bristly whenever I hear that word. Um, so I like to just say, is, so is, is talent for you something that's in your control or it's out of your control? I'm just wondering. I think talent is absolutely in your control. Um, I define talent as interest. I don't think that I had a. I mean, you know, I, I'm not a. I'm not a. What is it like a? A brain specialist like somebody who actually like puts things on people's heads and then studies like the parts of the brain that light up when they eat hot dogs uh but but i so so there's probably some kinds of dispositions that are genetically there right like like physically i am not built to play basketball at a professional level yeah i'm six foot one but you know i don't have the 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 built-in athleticism. I could probably push myself to a point where I could get close to it, or maybe even if I really, really, really wanted to, really work hard, maybe get to. But you know, there's there's certain levels that I can't reach physically, right? So okay, I'll I'll, I'll accept that. But when it comes to uh, like a like 
a knack for something, I think a lot of it has to do with interest. So when people say, oh, you're really talented, I'm like, no, 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 I'm not at all. I'm just really, really interested. I just care about comics more than anything. When I was in high school and I'd get in a fight with my girlfriend when we were on a date, she'd say, I'm going home. I'd say, okay, I'm going to go home and draw comics. And that's literally what I did is I would just go home and I would happily just, la, la, la. I don't care what she says, you know? I, I remember like thinking at one time I was, I was working on a comic. I was like, I think I'm supposed to be crying right now. <laughs> <laughs> because like she yelled at me about something but you know uh i didn't care because i cared about comics more um so that's why i got any good at this thing you know uh it's not because you know i i got some kind of gift some kind of genetic gift given to me by some outside force i resent that idea actually this idea of an outside force having anything to do with it mm-hmm the only outside forces were people in my life who pushed me in a direction or gave me any kind of encouragement. That's the outside force. Not like some kind of magical Obi-Wan Kenobi stuff that could make me move rocks. <laughs> what? No, that that's funny. Um, <laughs> Did I just paint myself into the atheist corner and now a whole bunch of people no. are going to be mad at me? I'm not an atheist, everybody. No, no, no. I'm not in anything. I No, no, I wasn't presuming that. I just was, uh, I was laughing as far as the... Uh, because I both think that uh, it, it's I, I I agree with what you said. It, it's some talent is is something you you have you can choose to grow and and uh, I think interest is a really inter uh, uh, I'm not going to say interesting way to put it. Uh, it is a uh, I like how that frames it up because it, it's a, you can be you can be focused on this and uh, grow your own talent. The uh, then the force aspect was uh, <clears throat> I like the old asp I, even even though I feel that way I like the old force definition, for the record. Oh, like the old like the original trilogy force definition. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 always bothered me about it? I mean, there's a lot of things that I, I don't want to talk Star Wars too much because everybody's tired of Star Wars. But one of the things that always bothered me about that series was a the fact that some people have a predisposition for it and some don't. Like, oh, well, Leia's your sister, so of course she can use it. And like the moment she finds out that she's his sister, she's like, oh, I can feel his presence. What? Uh, and Han Solo can never be a Jedi? That sucks. Uh, like, you don't have the right DNA, kid. Oh, that's awful. That's so anti-Western. And then like this whole, like, here, put this helmet on Luke and you can't see anything. Well, trust your feelings. Just trust. Listen to me. I know what you, you need to do here. And you just got to let go of your of your thinking mind and then you'll do the things right and then as soon as he lets go of his mind whack him whack him whack him with the lightsaber he does it perfectly this whole idea of like letting go of your intellect and just trusting your feelings and listen to the old man because he knows the, the the westerner in me goes Ooh, oh <laughs> that's funny uh but you know what people argue that hey return of the jedi luke is the one who breaks the rules luke is the one who doesn't do what yoda told him to goes and faces vader Finds it makes things worse, but then he's the one who fixes it by make by through his own volition, his own path that he chooses. And I go, okay, I grant you, I like that. But the whole like dressing in the the Eastern philosophy idea of relinquishing your identity to something else makes me shiver, makes me wake up in the night sweating. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you actually have. Uh... You've contemplated the meaning of that far more than I have, which uh, <laughs> I did. Uh, and uh, for some some entertainment, <laughs> some entertainment I really have. But to me, it's just like a laser sword is sweet, and I still think. That. <laughs> and I'm I'm uh, I'm not purely everything is a, is robotically analytical. I love to um, I love to let go of of that aspect and uh um which is one reason why i choose to do art challenges from time to time is to i am I'm, I'm forced to not depend on that aspect of my creative process so i need no, to good point uh to see you well what what have i learned what what is natural now because i'm continually by by creating uh on an ongoing basis i keep affecting what I can do and mm. uh, I can ignore that a little bit if I'm only staying in that rational um, Robert McKee's story this house is how you architect you know things you know positive to negative yeah. da, 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 uh, which is neat and super helpful but um, there is an aspect of that that's pretty dispassionate um, 
And I, find I no, I totally agree. That 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 is like probably the number one value of an art challenge is getting lost in the thing and just using the desperation of the deadline to see you through rather than having to stop and coldly wonder about each step of the game, right? And then the learning that you do only happens after the fact, right? It comes upon reflection. If I wasn't doing Thunder Punch Daily at the time I did that Boulder and Fleet comic, I probably would not have captured those thoughts and the takeaways that I got out of that. Maybe I would intuitively, but I wouldn't be able to articulate it as easily. But doing Thunder Punch Daily while I was doing the comic forced me to say, okay, at the end of each day where I did something, was there anything that I got out of this? What was what, What's going on in my head right now? Let's capture a few thoughts and see if it's worth repeating most of the thoughts as i was doing it was oh my god i'm never gonna finish <laughs> that was 90 percent of the content that was coming out of my head but but did you have the arrogant thing at first where you're like i'm so gonna do this this is uh i can't wait like when you begin and then did you become um daunted I, i'm just wondering did, was there yeah here's 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 okay going to that um i'm gonna chart my morale <laughs> as i tell this anecdote <laughs> Uh, with my, you know, holding my hand in the air for those who are listening to the audio and uh, not watching the video. Um, I started out with the kind of naive optimism of this is going to be really hard, but I think I can do it. You know, like that Mickey, Mickey Rooney, yeah, Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland, like let's put on a show in the backyard kind of idea. We can do it. Uh, and then I got the initial character designs done and like the first page drawn and I did the, I drew the first page in like an hour or so. And then the arrogance kicked in. Then I was like, oh man, look at this kid. I am going to kick the crap out of this comic. And I'm going to, you know, everybody's going to shower me with, with flowers. I'm going to get a ticker tape parade after this thing. Page three. I'm like, oh my God, what have I done? What have I done? I announced this to the public. I made a proclamation. This is going to be done. And here it is. Here's the here's the evil jersey sitting across the table from me, going, "You're a hack. You're a fool. You're you know you're a faker." And everybody's gonna know now because you're gonna have to put this comic online because you said you would, and they're gonna see how bad it is. No, no. <laughs> oh boy. That, that, that's like that's page three, and then like yeah. But when I got to page six or seven, I was back up. My I was riding a little higher again, mm -hmm. and uh, then it started turning into like a whoo. Ooh, I made it. I made it. Oh, I'm pretty good at this thing, huh? I'm pretty good at this thing. Now I can't wait to finish it. And I and I finished a day early because I was just so eager to get it done. I put aside work to actually finish it because I was so excited about it. Funny. So. So yeah. Is that is that is that like mirror at all your process? Uh oh, it does. Yeah, I see, and I know that I'm going to uh, get my own butt kicked, and even though I know it. I'm like, I still go in and like, yeah, I can't wait. Yeah. This is going to be great. I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm going to do, um, I, I don't even, I'm going to, it's so much discovery. There's so, I have no idea what I'm going to even make. And then, you know, and then obviously once I sort of architect it and think, look at this, I, now it's like I've, I've set up my ramps on either side of the buses. I just got to rev my motorcycle and jump these things. No biggie. <laughs> right. Yeah. But then, uh, uh, you know, then I realized, boy, that ramp looks kind of shaky. Oh, I'm almost out of gas. Oh, <laughs> and whatever. And yeah. I, yeah. And then I, obviously there's, there's a, I, I fight a lot of doubts and stuff uh, along the way too. So yeah. it's sort of like, here's another way of looking at it is it's a way to encapsulate the entire process of doing a long form comic in one day. You know, it's like they talk about like the, what is it? Like the five stages of, of grief or whatever, sure. you know, it's like, and then finally acceptance. It's like, it's, it's, it's taking all of that and making you go through it all in one day. And so you get a life experience in a day. <laughs> exactly. For those of you who have trouble making time for life experiences. <laughs> 24 hour comic. Exactly. It's a little boot camp, uh, a vacation away from your, your, your normal process. And, uh, you get to get to ride, ride that roller coaster of, of I'm awesome to my God, what have I done? And <laughs> on back again. I think it's cool though, that you could separate yourself from that and reflect on it. And because I, I bet that makes it easier to get through those darker times. Like when in the long form projects. Yeah. It, uh, because you, you're you're more aware that this is a cycle and this is something you're eventually going to come out of, right? So, yeah, it puts me into um, uh, an observer seat, not just 
Yeah, you know, we talked about that last week or last episode. Yep, exactly. And this, so it totally relates. Um, let's see here. Just uh, just to mention. Um, nah, whatever. I'll I'll put a link to this online. I don't have to uh, to tell the story because you yeah. had uh, all sorts of all sorts of interesting observations about Boulder and Fleet by the page and and whatnot. And yeah, for this, it just really. Um, I didn't have that. I mean, it's really this blur of... Um, um, it's a longer story completed in a shorter time. So, yeah. Yeah, with with less of those... Uh, um, I gained a, a, a huge appreciation by doing it uh, 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 for pacing and knowing when I need to go or trying to discover when I need to go quieter or present something and then try to build up a surprise because I really didn't have a chance to do that in the way... Um, that uh, that I wanted to in that whole architecture of the story. So looking back at it, I can think about, well, how do I feel about it? And, and where did I, you know, what, what kind of, how do I feel about the result as far as the story, the art? the I have a weird question for you, and I don't know if I've ever, ever asked this of you before. Um, it's rare that I get to talk to cartoonists who are also musicians. I think there's a lot of crossover between making music and making comics. At least I personally, I, I suspect it. I mean, as somebody who doesn't make music, uh, I can only suspect. But my, my little brother's a musician. You met him. You met Elliot. Mm -hmm. He and I have had long, extended conversations. And I wish I could get him to be on shows with me because he's like probably three times as interesting as I am. Uh, but he just, and that's probably why he's a lot more shy about getting behind the mic because he realizes that words have power. I'm a little bit more uh, uh, ca uh, callous and uh, cavalier about it. Um, but I wonder if when you're writing like this, how much of this you feel in terms of kind of like uh, when you're writing music, there's a pace to it, right? And the pace can change depending on the emotion you're trying to evoke. Like I think of like Tchaikovsky's uh, 1812 Overture and that that piece of music tells a story, right? Like there's parts that are really big and flamboyant, but then it will like it'll, it'll go back to like the ballad part where it swells and falls, and then it goes to the Russians marching across the snow, you know, and has a little bit more of this kind of like peppy, like we're coming, we're coming feel, and then all of a sudden it goes to that swell again to like the more ballad type part of it, and then it kicks over like to the big explosive part, and it'll even do slow builds to like you know, there's a part where like the the 1812 bit that will be played just on a couple flutes very softly and then the horns come in and then the the, the bigger brass comes in and it builds and builds and builds and then the cannons start you know firing off do you when you're pacing a story like this do you use that kind of like whatever organ is triggered by music like that to feel out the pacing of your story does it feel the same way I uh, it it does, but it's one of those things where you don't ha the it's good news bad news. You don't have to listen to that voice, so you may <laughs> you may gain an appreciation for like like for instance, a, a guitarist could be soloing for too long, or mm -hmm. um yeah, anyone in the band can be uh, sort of just not on the on the same page as far as representing the different elements of the story, different different members of the band, or um, some songs are are. Uh, could get their point across a lot shorter or whatnot. So it's that you have this pattern of how you're managing the information you're sharing in either in either case. Um, it's you, with with music you're sharing sound and the yeah. rhythm is part of the information. The, the the tone, the techniques you use, the instrumentation, all that is uh, well. You could also all the different art practices have their their instruments and then. The information that you use to that you uh, use instruments to bring about, and then there's the pattern of how you're doing it, which is like that pacing and stuff. And I think that's that that a lot of it does apply uh, because of those three different aspects. Um, and I think one of the biggest th aspects that's super applicable is that that rhythm and pacing. Let that's me ask you this: I want to keep on this analogy for a second. And, and everybody who's listening, we're still talking in an analogy of music. Um, you said sometimes the guitarist can go on a solo too long, right? Does that where does that what makes somebody go on a solo too long? Is it a sense of this is awesome? I'm focused on this thing I'm doing. I just don't want to stop. 
is it like a, a a a failure to understand the big picture of where the thing is going is that what it is or is it something else uh well i'm going to say this totally relates to the beginning part of the conversation it's well why is that person doing that creative act and then the people that are choosing to be there to be part of it and and listen to it or read it or whatever and or in the case of yeah music uh they're 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 listening and they, those those could be either well met like the uh the, like the guitarist is 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 trying to really crank up and, and uh affect emotion by mm -hmm. uh changing the pace changing the pattern and uh try to go from then contrast i guess that's the other big thing with with the different art art techniques i mean you you get their pacing through that through the contrast and uh, rhythm now if they are in tune and sort of part of why yeah why the guitarist is doing the solo it's to just put this it's to go to the overloading point of emotion to then let it go but then mm -hmm. if the pattern never changes and it stays there that uh, people get numb and so is that person doing i don't know why the person would be doing it so some guitarists yeah it's 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 uh in my uh, how many guitarists does it take to screw in a light bulb is, is is this a joke? Is yeah. this a real thing? Yeah, I'm just... How many? I don't know. Uh, one to do it and five to say they could have done a better job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a little, little musical humor for you folks out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, I think that that same thing could apply to cartoonists. Um, sure. But yeah, I'm just trying to get a sense of... like yeah. when, when I'm feeling out the rhythm of a story... Uh, I think about that a lot. Like what you, everything you said about a solo, it's like you're trying to affect emotion. You're trying to say, this is the awesome part. This is the part where I'm really going to get you. you know, we're all going to raise our hands and scream. We're on the crest of the roller coaster. But eventually you have to go down and you have to calm down a second. And part of the way I manage that personally is I think about what's the big picture. I try to keep one eye on zoomed in on what the moment is, but then the other eye is like always focused on where am I ultimately going with this whole thing. And, and and maybe my example is, isn't quite applicable to everybody because I'm talking about a lot of the books I write are ensemble books, like a big cast, 12 or more mm -hmm. characters. So I have a lot of places to go. I have a lot of places visually and tonal wise to zip around, to change the tone, change the pacing. Um, but yeah, if, it's like as a guy who writes a lot of action adventure stories for kids, if it was page after page of explosions... The first three explosions, yeah, the kids are going to be going, yeah, but page six, it's like, oh, there's another one. You know, you got to have that, you got to zoom in and out of that, of, of a visual variety as well as like a, a pacing variety. Pacing in terms of density of word balloons. I'm looking at uh, your 24-hour comic. There's a lot of dialogue in this thing, man. I know. But not all the time. But not all the time. I mean, here's the study hall scene I'm looking at. You know, that, that seems a little bit more of a slower pace. Oh, yeah. But then... Yeah, later on, like the it gets more verbally dense. Oh, but look at this action sequence, not as verbally dense, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, th that's a pacing thing. It's like it's like a, the rhythm, the rhythm of density of word, density of image, also density of panels on the page. Twelve panels on a page versus three panels on a page versus one panel on a page, that kind of thing. And then there's the density of like, how many word balloons per panel. Uh, how much detail is in each panel, right? Is it a crowd scene in every panel? Um, so uh, you have a lot of options of, of what to switch from, not just like plot element, not just like, oh, well, let's go look at this character. But you also have the option to say like, well, can I zoom out? Can I zoom out really far back to get like a more kind of tranquil transitional moment? I mean, if you read my graphic novel, The Front, I do that a lot. That's a, like almost, I use, I use it almost as a crutch is if I have to change scenes, I start with three quarter down shot, hundred feet away, to say this is where the characters are. It's both a uh, a staging element to say, okay, here's where all my characters are, so you have a sense of the location. But it's also a way to take a breath before diving into the next act or what do they call it? What what is that thing they call when they switch it in music when they, they switch to the middle eight or whatever in like a, a pop song? Uh, songs songs have different structures, so it could be you know A B A B C. You know, so A would be your um, uh, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, you know, intro, outro, whatever. It's, yeah, it's just your structure. 
right? Yeah. So you had a, uh, but and then with your structure, you have a way to connect the parts. And mm -hmm. so in music, a lot of times you'll hear uh, drum fills and uh, the, the drums playing a role of, of helping you uh, follow along on the rhythm. And uh, when all of a sudden, and then, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, uh, those those sort of uh, change ups. They know that well. This is a. It's it's like a, it's it's an exciting hmm, and then different thing, excite or or take a step back, like rest. You know, and uh, yeah, it's a way to 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 do exactly what you were saying with those uh, scene changes. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like yeah, taking taking a break, taking a rest, taking a breath before. I mean, it's the same thing with public speaking too, right? Like I I, I did um, mm. my ignite talk. Uh, the comics are great one. I did it in January. Is that when I did the one in Ann Arbor? I think. Uh, I did it in Ann Arbor uh, for Ann Arbor Ignite, and then I did it again a few months ago, the same talk for um, Ignite Great Lakes. And the second time I did it, I had the same amount of speed, but I had trained myself enough in that talk to where I knew how to pace it out better and take a few little stop and take a breath have, and, and change the rhythm of my language so that I could build up something where I'm really getting excited and then I can slow down a little bit and say, well, you know, this is a neat part. And then I'm going to get really excited again. And it was a way, It's this comes out of teaching too, it's a way to keep people's attention, right? If I'm just constantly going at a million miles an hour for five minutes, I'm going to lose them because it becomes noise after a while. We can only, we can only hold our attention on things for so long. And uh, so you have to pace it out. You have to back off, slow down. And get fast again. This goes for music. This goes for comics. This goes for any kind of storytelling, right? I agree, and actually, it and it ties back to the guitar solo thing. So, if you are sharing this information with the point of keeping people following along, versus just saying, "Boy, do I love to talk," right? There, those are that would be the the equivalent of the self indulgent guitar solo. Okay, okay, that's good. I didn't expect us to talk so much about pacing today. This was cool. Um, so, like, so, like, using the the speech analogy a little bit more, just a little bit, is like if I were to go and tell that story again, where I was charting my morale on, um, you know, like a line that I'm moving with my hand. It'd be like, okay, so there I was, and I was in this place, and I thought this thing was going to happen, but then it got really cool because, and listen to the pacing of my voice when I do this. But then it got really cool because this guy who I really, really like came up and said, "Hey, you want to do a thing?" And I said, "Yeah, I really want to do the thing." But then we turned the corner, and then I saw somebody who I really, oh, I just really don't like this person, and I thought this is gonna suck. But then I got a little closer, and I realized that person who wasn't wasn't who I thought it was, and it got really cool, and I got really excited because it was all these people that I really wanted to talk to. And then all of a sudden, oh, you know what they talked about? They talked about pooping their own pants, and that is not something I want to talk about with people. So I was like, oh, God, this sucks after all. So I guess the thing I learned today is that even cool people can talk about dumb stuff every once in a while. The end. There's a story, and that was paced, right? <laughs> it was. <laughs> I don't know if I did it well, but... <laughs> no, and, and that's the, there you go. Like you mentioned, uh, the, the scene changes being a crutch and whatever. I think th that you'll have your own styles with, with how you connect those different parts and how you, um, so you shift gears and to not make that too abrupt or whatever. Uh, and that's where you get different styles and, and that's cool. Like, like a lot of metal is about that shift in emotion from, um, the change from peace to intense in, intense something right and uh mm -hmm. you can't have that switch up if it if everything is constantly intense all the time and chances are yeah. a song that is that way is brief like your yeah. ignite talk your ignite talk is kind of like a speed metal of speeches <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> i have never had anything that I've done compared to something cool like that before. That was pretty, I, I'm, I'm going to hang on to that analogy because I feel like it legitimizes what I do. <laughs> it stands on its own, but it's, uh, <laughs> uh, 
the, 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 the sad part is, is that that's the part that everybody mentions about it. It's like, it's not like, oh, you made your points really well. Or like, oh, I really walked away feeling like I want to read comics now. Uh, everybody's always like, that was fast. Oh, wow. Even when I did the talk at, at Ignite Great Lakes, that's what she said when I walked off the stage. It's like, oh, wow, the next presenter is going to have to learn to talk faster. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that I demonstrated some kind of skill that I can talk really fast. But uh, I was really hoping you guys would walk out going like, oh, man, I got to read a comic tomorrow, you know. But, oh, well. It's uh, Rose... it's like a great, well, it's like a really fast, great guitar solo. I mean, people notice that, uh, wow, you know, Jersey, Jersey can play. That's awesome. That's true. That's true. Like, when you listen to an Eddie Van Halen solo, nobody ever comments on, oh, this is inspired by classical music theory of such and such. It's like, look at how fast he could do that finger tapping, right? Mm hmm yeah, so, so uh, that speech is your eruption. <laughs> <laughs> All right, enough about my damn speech. Right. Uh, are, are, are we wrapping this up? Are we coming? In, is there any closing thoughts on this? Anything that we want to, you know, come around full circle? And um, I think there's a there's a strong connection as far as uh, its audience connection um, is is the connection, <laughs> the the connecting thought as far as uh, whether you're uh, thinking about. What you're sharing online, your public persona, or however connected and, and related that is to your, your private self and, and how you choose to uh, interact, I think there's a, a similar sort of a choice you have when you're, when you're creating is with your, your pacing and, and engaging your audience and how are you connecting with them. And uh, they're all uh, related creative acts. Good point. You know, it's like it's like uh, pacing yourself in your social media stream, so you're not just like pumping forty tweets like in a row and then not talking anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, pacing it out, pace it out, and like try to build a narrative with what you're doing. And when I say narrative, it's not the the data that's in the the messages that you that you share, but a narrative in terms of what do all of these things amount to? What does all this stuff collectively say? And have I structured them in a way? No, I'm not talking about don't improvise because that was also a theme today, wasn't it? Was improvisation is a great way to learn something about yourself and also have fun with this stuff. This isn't all deliberate uh, Sun Tzu art of war kind of strategizing, right? It doesn't always have to be that way. So yeah, yeah, play with it too, but ultimately it's about... Uh, Communicating an idea about a larger a larger message about who you are deliberately and genuinely, whether it's constructed or not, whether it's a, constructed through a narrative, whether it's constructed through social media, and then there should be some kind of a general pace to it all. So as to not bore the audience or desensitize them to something. That was pretty good, Rob. Hey, that, I, you brought it home. <laughs> it rocks. <laughs> With the guitar solo. Sweet solo. Thank yeah, you. Good, that, night. <laughs> <laughs> good night, Cleveland. Uh, so, uh, okay. Well, uh, you know, we should say that, uh, you know, what this, um, this story, story building uh, analogy was inspired by was I was getting ready with my notes and my presentations for 30 classes in 30 days. This is part of the Comics Fundamentals series that I teach. And uh, I'm bringing it to Lean Into Art. 30 classes in 30 days can be found at leanintoart.com. Yes? That's right. Yeah, just uh, check out leanintoart.com, and it's uh, a link right at the top. 30 classes in 30 days. You can, uh, you can still register. It's, I mean, it works out if at the gold level. I mean, it's only 10 bucks a class. And that's kind of wild. I mean, it's, it's something that... Uh, you would go to your art center locally, or in our case, we're online. And uh, some of our classes will be meeting in Adobe Connect, like this podcast is. And uh, mm -hmm. the others uh, will be, yeah, uh, downloadable as, as a podcast and, and video and all sorts of stuff. And lots of cool topics from um, uh, some specific things as far as like, you know, Jersey, you're also doing uh, uh, lettering, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, a topic that I'm very passionate about. Is uh, is the way sound works in a, a, a soundless visual medium, mm. 
And so I'm going to be teaching a class on how, how I letter, how I letter in Adobe Illustrator. This is my technique called together from a lot of other places where I learned how other people do it. But this is like my strategy for lettering on, on a comics page, but also to a larger point, uh, something that I'm much more interested in than the actual how is the why. Why do you make this sound look this way and not that way? How do you design a good sound effect? And hey, sound effects are more than just Bam Pow and the Batman TV show. Sound effects are the texture of your story in terms of audio, but it's also a aesthetic component. You put sound in there in a very deliberate and certain way so that it is aesthetically harmonious with the overall piece. Mm -hmm. And then there's another layer to it as well, is that how does color contribute to the quality of the sound? Is throwing a rock through the air... Let's figure that out first. We got to decide how we spell it. Oh, it's okay. I'm gonna do whoosh. All right, that that kind of sounds like a rock flying through the air. Whoosh. W h o o s h h exclamation point. Uh, and there's there's I have certain theories about like consonant and vowel combinations. More consonants mean this. More vowels mean that. Um, but then okay, let's design the letters so they, they evoke the quality of that air, the air passing by the rock, right? Uh, how, what kind of lines would you use? Would you use a, a scraggly line or a smooth line? Well, it depends on the kind of sound. Like a, a rock falling into a pond is going to have a certain kind of line quality, whereas a rock flying through the air has a different line quality. A big metal ball falling in the middle of concrete sounds one way, but punching a big slab of meat with your fist sounds another way, right? So this all can be communicated through line. Then Pretty the much. next layer is what color are you going to use? What color contributes to the quality of the sound or if it's too uh you also have to c consider how does that color interact with the other colors on the page if it's a nighttime scene and like oh this color the sound would have a, like a deep purple kind of quality to it Ooh, now it's kind of losing it in the background because it's a it's a night scene well i gotta punch it up a little bit to make it more aesthetically harmonious make it pop just the right amount so there's a lot of things to consider when designing a sound effect if you really care about how all this works together in comics and i love getting nerdy and, and talking about it forever and ever it's i think it's slated for what an hour and a half I'm, hour. So I'd have to pull up the calendar, which the calendar is all available uh, to know when the classes occur. Um, it's at uh, it's on the same page. Uh, 30, 30 classes uh, in thirty days. Uh, a link at the top of Lean Into Art, um, which you know you describing all that thought process going into sound. Uh, it reminds me that I mean that class mentions Illustrator, which that'll be cool to to, to teach those techniques as well. But it sounds super applicable no matter what you're using to. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm just going to be using Illustrator as my demonstration tool, but any vector program that you could do this in, a, in flash, you could do this in what other vector programs are out there that I, I don't know about. Um, uh, Inkscape. Okay. Open I've never heard of that one. Um, Inkscape. But yeah, th th yeah, there's tons of different ways to go at this thing. You could do this in Photoshop. You could do this, you could do this on the page, right? You could do this with actual lines on paper. Uh, thinking about this kind of stuff. I'm just going to be demonstrating it through one piece of digital software that I like to use. But what the bigger idea is, is for me, is the theory behind it. And like I was good, like I was saying, it's like an hour, hour and a half class, something like that. But it probably will run longer because I tend to get carried away with that topic. Something that I, <laughs> I did way back when I used to do the Art and Story podcast. I remember, this is a couple years ago, we did an episode called The Big Sound Effect. And... Uh, it was born out of the fact that somebody challenged me online and said, you can't do a whole episode on sound effect design. You just can't. There's not enough there to talk about. And I was like, oh, really? And we wound up doing a two-hour episode where I don't think I changed my pace. I think I was doing the endless guitar solo as I was proclaiming my love for sound effect design. And that guy came back to me and said, okay, okay, apparently you can talk about sound effects for, more, for an hour or more. Uh, so... It's super helpful, and honestly, um, I can't wait to uh, to see that class too because uh, I I use sound quite a bit in my main comic. Um, and let's see, and the other teachers that that'll be there, uh, Kevin Cross will be teaching color theory. Brandon Dayton will be teaching line work theory. Kim Holm will be uh, doing a, a couple of really interesting sounding workshops. Um, the dramaturgy of silliness, an improvisation workshop. I've been present at this workshop before. It's super cool. Awesome. It's uh, how how to improvise a story. That's basically what it's about. It's about how to embrace silliness and embrace silly ideas that sound absurd at the outset, but 
using simple improvisational skills, you can combine any silly combination of elements into something that is a workable narrative. Yeah, that sounds uh, rather handy. Uh, I mean, so there's like this general theme of of uh, very useful uh, creative classes, essentially, yes. and a whole darn month of them. And yeah, the calendar is almost full. I'm just dropping in a few few more items on there. Uh, but you can subscribe to the calendar on the 30 classes and 30 days page at leanintoart.com if you're curious about what you're getting and when. Calendar's not finished yet. Uh, and who knows, we might wind up doubling up some days, meaning that there, there might be, we might have more than we know what to do with. Because Rob and I keep, every time we talk to each other, we're like, oh, we should do this. Oh, we should do this. <laughs> And then Rob, because he's an idiot and likes to take on way more than he should, uh, says, I'm going to do nine classes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did a podcast about it, too. Um, I know you did. <laughs> yeah. And as I was listening to it, I was I was just feeling my, my heart just got heavier and heavier. And I felt my shoulders slow. And she was like, you're really going to take all that on? What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's... Uh, I. I love to, to, to share the stuff that, uh, there, there you go. I, 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 I experiment, I'm like the consumer reports of, uh, of creative helpfulness, right? Um, except I'm the chair that's getting punched by the, uh, by the, act, the, the activating foot. It's like, yeah, <laughs> you can sit in this chair about 5,000 times and it'll fall apart. Is it uh, difficult? Is it probably not a good idea? Let's do it. Yeah. Rob's credo. Which more of us should actually probably take on. I think the world would be a, a much happier and more exciting place to live in if more people took on that that credo. <laughs> um, yeah, as long as not they're not in, involved in the hard sciences and um, space travel. Um, that, that's what that's what the Apollo program was to the T. The entire gosh. Apollo program was, hey, in ten years, let's take this technology that's not even proven, let's go to the moon and put people on it. Make sure you fill in the gaps with some with some good uh, good hard science then, because <laughs> they did oh, yes. sit on a lawn chair and and uh, um, strap bottle rockets to it. <laughs> no, no, they did not. <laughs> Although you've seen that flying bedstead that almost killed Neil Armstrong. That was almost what it was. Oh, funny. The 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 Apollo lunar excursion module uh, mock up that they used on Earth to test out how to fly that thing. Oh no! I actually didn't see that. I have to check out that. There's probably a video of it or something, right? YouTube. Yeah, and, and it's it's documented in that uh, recreation of the entire thing from Earth to the Moon, that Tom Hanks vehicle. Oh, it's a great series. Oh. If if you care at all about science and space travel and really really great stories about the heroes, watch the Apollo 12 mission. It's the most fun, and it's totally. Uh, it's 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 America. It's everything that's great about America. It's like it's all these really hardworking people busting their backs to make this impossible thing happen. Crisis occurring when the the rocket gets struck by lightning right after liftoff, and the whole boards go out, and then like really smart people fixing it, and then these cocky, obnoxious Americans being goofballs about the whole mission and having fun with it. And, you know, Neil Armstrong gets off the ladder and he says, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Pete Conrad, when he gets off the ladder, he says, whoopee! <laughs> now that to me is America. That's that's like, we worked really, really hard. Let's have, have a good time with it, please. <laughs> we don't have to be solemn about everything. Awesome. I do need to see that. Yeah, because I do, I do love that. And in, in some way, how you you connected that to me or whatever. So that uh, is the most ridiculous um, compliment I've ever heard. So, <laughs> um, so I'm happy to partake in that silliness though. <laughs> but anyway, so yes, yeah, so lean into art.com, click the 30 classes and 30 days link. There's still time to sign up uh, and there's still a few gold seats left. So uh, if you're interested or if you know somebody who think you think would be interested in, in, in this, such a thing. Uh, and then there's the silver tier, which is like a hundred uh, is that right? No, 170 is 170. the silver tier. And Which, that's so it, you still get all the classes. It's just uh, you're not a part of the live aspect. Yep. yep. You just get recorded versions of the live aspect. So, But we'll all be in the forum, and it's going to be a fun time. Uh, hey, we got to pat you on the back about that gallery that you built. We haven't talked about that since, we did, since you built it. Funny. Um, well, I... Let's do a little uh, teaser of this episode, and we'll cover it in more detail. How about next one? Um, right. There is a uh, there's a cool 
I'm, I'm, I'm proud of this feature because it sort of it exemplifies how we want to celebrate our teachers and our students that are part of Lean Into Art. We have a shared gallery where um, if you're a teacher or a student at Lean Into Art, um, send us uh, some of send us some of your work each week, and uh, we'll we'll feature it there. And if you got some notes about it, we have a form that you can log in and submit stuff to, and uh, we uh, we'll, we'll we show it in a um, this uh, this gallery thing that that I, I crafted up. That's um, um, it's just a cool slideshow you can pull up and sit back and have a sip of your coffee, take a break, see some neat work. Um, or you can sort of navigate through and see and if you're curious about what the newest stuff is and uh, explore it. Um, it it's, it's available at leanintoart.com. Look at the menu on the side of the page. And it's called the Lean Into Art Gallery of Creative Works. Super cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I conclude a lot of my uh, multi-week workshop series with a showing of the students' works where the parents are invited to come for snacks. And we put the work up on the wall so that they can see what everybody made and that's that's cool but then I also have the students stand next to their work and explain how, why they did what they did why they make this panel big why they make this panel small it's reflective activity it allows them to reflect on what they've accomplished it 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 shows the parents that the students are now the experts but it also helps educate the general public as well uh, and people who might be interested in taking the class that this is what we do in this class it's a way to show off what cool stuff is going to be happening here so yeah, I encourage everybody who signs up to participate in that. Uh, I'm going to be adding some things to it in the next day or so. So, uh, and we're going to make a big, big uh, spotlight out of it every Thursday, I think, wasn't it, or was it every Wednesday? Uh, we're t <clears throat> it, it's uh, Wednesday right now is the plan. But uh, okay. But uh, while it's a permanent thing, the stuff we do around the communication of it and how it's going to flow. Um, right now we're saying Wednesday, but that can evolve. Yeah, it can always change. So. Mm -hmm. Anything else that we need to make noise about? Good luck on 24-hour comic day, Rob. Thanks. I'll, I'll do my best to report on it dur during it, and I'll certainly share uh, some thoughts uh, afterward. Okay. Well, if, if, if you do wind up being able to capture some of the event itself, you know, mm -hmm. being there, if you can pull yourself out of being there to, to show the rest of us what it's like to be there, uh, where would you be putting that information? Let's see. I think, um, boy, make that call right now. Uh, uh, you don't have to. We can always put it in the show notes. One of two URLs, and it'll be either robstenzinger.com or it'll be uh, interactive-storyteller.com. Okay. One of those two for sure. And Twitter too, right? Like you'll probably be like saying, like, "Hey, I put a thing there." That's Definitely. Like Rob. So if there's a little mystery, like, "Well, where's Rob talking about this?" and you're curious, uh, yeah, check out uh, twitter.com/slash robstenzinger. More people need to follow you there anyway, so because you got to collect them all. <laughs> <laughs> cool, and then I will do a sweet guitar solo for you all. <laughs> oh, are you gonna do stuff like that? Where you're like, if I get to ten thousand followers, I'll record myself doing a guitar solo. <laughs> I'll I'll eat my weight in hamburgers. Oh uh, no, uh, that's yeah, a they're... great way to get people who are actually signed on to your you know your value to do something like that. Yeah, give away an iPad. <sighs> <laughs> no, I'm not doing that kind of thing. Uh, I may do it for the fun of it, um, but if it's if it's incidentally crass or foolish, uh, you know that's incidental. Um, no, the guitar solo. Th yeah, no. <clears throat> <laughs> no, just no, no. no. I, that was a joke, folks. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks everybody for downloading and listening. Uh, show notes are at leanintoart.com, and uh, until next time. I've been Jersey Drost of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I'm Rob Stenzinger of uh, RobStenzinger.com. Rob Stenzinger on the Twitter. And this is where I say, okay, bye.